Hey guys, how's it going today? It's me, Andy, aka Dinosaur Comics, and today I have a special guest, wildlife educator, Psycomer Christian Flores is here to hang out with me, and I'm going to draw his favorite dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus, while we chill. You want to talk about yourself, Christian? Yeah, so my name is Christian Flores. I'm a wildlife educator, and I work in Psycom. Um, the majority of what I do is basically teach uh, while uh, life on our planet, past and present, so yeah. So how did how did you get your start? Like, what, when did the when did the passion begin, dude? Wait, can, can you hear me? me it was basically go. when I grew up, uh, or actually when I was sorry, when I was three years old, I got San from TV, and I got to see wildlife documentaries, Steve Irwin, all of that, and I just got enamored by it. So I feel like for a lot of kids, when they find that one thing that they really like, they stick with it for a bit, but eventually it just kind of trails off as they grow up. For me, it never left. So I just always loved animals and dinosaurs. Um, I remember my parents would tell me when I got a new dinosaur toy or stuffed animal, I would take it to class for show and tell and say, tell, talk in front of the whole class about this new thing. Basically, now it's just the exact same thing, but uh, online. So <laughs> on the that's internet. Kind of the vibe. <laughs> No, I feel exactly. Like, I feel I vibe with that, dude. So, like, where, what exactly were you watching? It was just like animal, but like I'm guessing Steve Irwin, obviously, <laughs> based on your name. Yeah. Yeah. So Steve Irwin was obviously a big inspiration for me growing up. Um, to learn, I think for him it was very much, yeah, these animals are interesting, unique, and that energy that he carried with it was powerful. But also, these animals have minds and bodies. They think on their own. They they just want to exist in their environment and fill the role that they have. Mm -hmm. So having that perspective for people really brought in a whole genre of people interested in animals. The same thing that Jurassic Park did for this influx of new paleontologists and people caring about um, extinct life. That was Steve Rush for me. And I, I liked both. So now I became both pretty much. <laughs> I, I feel it. So basically, you just never let go of that like joy of just sitting in front of Anna, the TV watching Animal Planet, but now you want to do it too. Something like that. Um, but yeah, so I do very uh, blog style posts on my Instagram. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Craig Gets Christian. So um, I do very blog style posts. Uh, I've done some educational videos as well with a buddy of mine in video production um, where we've done a couple videos. There's still one more left coming this month. So uh, be prepared for that. Um, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun ride. I've been able to meet some incredible people, uh, like Dinosaur Comics, <laughs> along the way. <laughs> I'm all right. Um, it's, it's been great. Yeah, it's been great, man. Um, <laughs> made some great friendships and just connections, and just oh, I feel like in a lot of posts that I do, I always say thank you. I appreciate you guys, like all this stuff. But really, when I think about it, how do I not have gratitude? How do I not feel appreciation for all the things that have just like happened, and not just like things just opportunities just coming out of nowhere in my lap like i had to reach you know, reaching out to people like taking the effort to do these things like my whiteboard behind me this is where i, I write all my good ideas and <laughs> my my posts um, uh -huh. that i do so yeah it's just a lot of time of just putting the effort into it and people seem to like it so i just keep going with it <laughs> no i feel it dude like no i i feel the same way where because a lot of my posts are also like I don't have a whiteboard. I use like my notes in my phone <laughs> and I just like, okay, this uh, one's going to go, yeah. you know, every, you know, this on this day, this one's going to go on this day. And it's, it's low key stressful in my opinion. <laughs> I uh, get that. Do yeah. you, do you feel that way too? Uh, I mean, for the, I have it, I have it on the whiteboard, but I also have it on my phone. So that way if I pop up with an idea, oh, I want to talk about this species. Let me put that on my phone. Mm -hmm. Speaking of my phone, I have, I am so mad with my phone right now because what? I need to get a new one. Like it is, it is, I've had it for like five, six years, and it just starts restarting on its own now. Like it's done. Like I just need to get a new phone now. What do you got? A 4S? <laughs> I have, I have a Samsung. It's the S7, but I've had it for like five, six 
years. Uh -huh. And it's so funny too, because um, every time I, I've been telling people like I need to get a new phone, and everyone's uh -huh. like, oh, get an iPhone, get an iPhone. One of my friends told me, oh, you should get an iPhone. It's They're far better than uh, Samsung. And I was like, really? Because I've had my phone for like five, six years. It's pretty good. And he's like, oh, you've had it for five, six years? I've gone through, I've gone through like multiple iPhones. In I was like, space. this is your selling point? <laughs> This is your selling point to tell me that you've been through iPhones multiple times and I've had the same phone for five, six years. Like you're not a salesman, dude. <laughs> oh, speaking of phones, okay. What do you, yeah. do you think, what's your, like, you've only had one phone. Do you think like phones are decent for like wildlife photography? Oh yeah. I mean, a lot of people that, that, that are actual wildlife photographers like when people usually message them like hey like what's the first step to get into this usually a lot of people just say get a good phone like get a quality phone um i mean yeah do you to have a camera a camera is good for taking pictures and video mm -hmm. if you have a phone you could have something that takes good pictures but also has all the implications of a phone so mm -hmm. the versatility and especially with phone cameras just getting better and better it's uh, i'd rather get a nice phone than spend or less than that on a, on a nice camera but still i feel it yeah do you do you do like your own photographs too um so that's a good question so um no a lot of the posts that i do uh, or all the posts i pretty much do it's either one or two so for modern animals it's usually um the creative whatever's on the creative commons that's why if you ever look at my post you'll see um in the, the comments references. all these all these links um that um say where it came from um i use the creative commons i use shutterstock um i use alamy um alamy is super expensive though so shutterstock kind of the main one that i use for extinct species um i either directly commission um people to do the work or um ask artists that i know um the one artist that i work the most with is julio lacerda if that uh, name is familiar uh, he's one of the predominant artists in pbs eons if you've seen that on youtube yeah i love that um, guy yeah, dude, he, oh man, that guy is something else. So he and I uh, met um, earlier la or later uh, last year, and I reached out to him to do some stuff for Croctober, which we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. um, but I reached out to him to work on some stuff for Croctober, uh, which is an event I do in October every year to uh, bring awareness to crocodilians. Mm -hmm. um, so we were talking about some extinct species. Um, we did a few works on that. We were like, wow, wow, like that was pretty cool. Like hey, I want to work with you more on something. And so we just kept on going from there. And yeah, he's been, a, we've been friends ever since. Like we just clicked. So um, yeah, I'm just very appreciative for his work. And obviously like we just have a good friendship and dynamic as well. So uh -huh. yeah, it's been great. Uh -huh. How, how'd you guys meet? So uh, I DM him on Instagram. So like I said, Croctober is an event I do every October to bring awareness to crocodilians. So I DM'd him. Um, I didn't even think he was going to reply. So <laughs> I DM'd him and I said, hey, I love your work. Like, I'd love to work together on something. I don't know what it would be, but I'd just love to work on some art. To mm -hmm. um, and he's like, oh, yeah, like, I'd, I'd love to do something. Like, what do you have in mind? And so I told him and we um, did four images. We did uh, Sinosuchus, Dacosaurus, Caprosuchus, and Morosuchus. So we wanted, I wanted to have some diversity of um, different crocodilian forms because a lot of people when you think of a crocodilian you think about just this four-legged droopy sort of thing that walks and swims when crocodilians have been through so many different body plans in the world that it's, it's crazy to think about the diversity that crocodilians once had mm -hmm. and um, for me i feel too that i i feel like i have a very imaginative mindset like i think of what this environment looks like. What is this animal in the environment? What is it doing? What are natural behaviors? So I guess that's really great because I'm combining what I know about modern species and what I know about prehistory and extinct species and putting it together mm -hmm. to make these animals and lifelike as they're not alive anymore. So why crocodiles? What makes them the most badass reptile in your opinion? <laughs> Um, I wouldn't call them the most bad, the most bad reptile, but they're pretty close. Um, <laughs> I just love crocodilians because they're, they just have such an interesting history, diversity. A lot of people don't even know that crocodilians are reptiles. They're more closely related to birds than lizards, snakes, and turtles. Mm -hmm. As archosaurs. Oh, people don't know. Also, hello, Catherine because and Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> they said hello in the chat. Hey, guys.
Um, so yeah, their uh, crocodilians are in the group called Archosauria, which uh, split off from reptiles and eventually became into birds, pterosaurs, and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So, well, actually birds and dinosaurs are together. But you know what I mean. So crocodilians are more closely related to birds and dinosaurs and even pterosaurs than they would be to lizards, snakes, and turtles. That's so weird to think about because when you think about like a like an alligator or a crocodile, you think of just like giant lizard that likes to swim. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And I feel like people don't realize like the evolutionary or like the phylogenetic history of these animals. And it's very yeah. it's very interesting. And I, I feel I don't know, maybe there's like a lacking in education on these. I mean I guess it's obvious, it's not required. It's not like you're gonna teach a fourth grader like, all right, why why is the crocodile closer to the bird than to this monitor lizard? Yeah. You know what I mean? Today like, class we're gonna learn about the archosaur. <laughs> we're gonna learn about archosaur, it's gonna be on the pop quiz later. That would be a cool class totally. though, I'm not gonna lie. Well, yeah. I'd be in. I'd, I'd, I'd be either the teacher or the student. I'm cool with either <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, what is, what yeah, but I mean... It's... Go, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead, go ahead. No, you go, you go, uh, but go yeah, ahead. I mean, that's just, that's just what I care about too, is also bringing light to animals that don't get hype and attention that they deserve. But in conservation, when you think about conservation groups, a lot of the flagship species that you see are going to be tigers, gorillas, elephants, which they have their place in the world. We need to keep them. Yes. But... There's also a lot of reptiles and amphibians and birds and just different species. Even, even even in mammals, a lot of mammals don't get a lot of the attention that they deserve because they're just not those flagship charismatic megafauna that people get attracted to. So that, that can go into um, the most recent event that I did. It was Komodo March. So Komodo March was an event I did in the entire month of March where we did some educational posts and brought attention to Komodo dragons who are in a very small and fragmented space for their habitat and it's only getting smaller and smaller as the years go by with humans habit uh then encroaching on their space mm -hmm. so there's some other influences that are affecting where they are but right now it's really just space getting smaller and smaller so what we did is we or what i had happened to do is i reached out to some friends of mine that were zookeepers that worked directly with komodo dragons and i interviewed them and you can find it on my um highlight on my instagram i did interviews with them i interviewed them hey what are what do you know about komodo dragons what's your experience being with them right in front of your face and for a lot of people in the general public it's it's a big uh big hungry lizard that just wants to eat you with its uh bacteria mouth mm -hmm. and that's not the case they're intelligent animals that think I think more than what we ever expect and their their mouths aren't well their mouths can't have bacteria but it's not bacteria that really does it it's venom and you and i worked together on a venom diagram to show that and just bring that awareness to people who know nothing about them and then eventually we did an auction which we freaking slammed we we did two auctions with some artists so now it's just now not only is it collaborating with zookeepers it's collaborating with um, content creators artists and bringing things together it's mm. it's not just about not just about me and i don't want it to make it about me. it's about this whole community as a whole really the big picture of the world and taking care of the life that lives in the world mm -hmm. oh so, yeah and, and just go on too i got my replica komodo dragon skull <laughs> so, <laughs> i want to um, imagine yeah. you just pulled it out of your pocket like <laughs> <laughs> i just like just had it here ready <laughs> um yeah so komodo dragons they have um uh, you know if you look on my instagram you'll see the venom diagram that andy and i worked on mm -hmm. um at the lower jaw at the lower jaw you'll see that there are actual venom ducks in there this was um done by i think in 2009 by toxicologist brian fry and he found that there was found um traces of venom or what were bee venom on the lower jaw but when they bite onto prey it comes out from the lower jaw and out. These teeth already do it up. They can cause, cause blood loss, um, wounds that you would not want to take. But once those wounds are open, venom's then doing the work. Um, it's a hemotoxic venom, meaning that it affects the blood. So when a normal person gets hurt, usually your blood goes to the wound to seal it up. Photo dragon venom stops that from happening. So you're going to continue to bleed and bleed and bleed until you're so weak from blood loss that you can't fight back and they're gonna eat you as you are um, or you die on your own blood loss so it's intense but it's it's life it's science it's something to learn about that most people wouldn't even know okay here's something i've always wondered about the um komodo dragon so first 
Like, for example, why did it take so long to find these venom glands, or for them to be like, put, like for there to be a paper published on these venom glands for Varanids? Good. That's a great question. Well, one, uh, well, there's a few reasons. One, it's unfortunately re some reptiles don't really get a lot of attention. They just don't get the the funding. Like, in order for someone from an institution or a zoo to do a study on something like that, they need the funding. So to tell yeah. these people, these other sources, hey, I would like funding to figure out if Komodo dragon spit can do something extra. And obviously it's gonna get pitched better than that. But if some people just think, no, it's bacteria, like I'm not gonna fund this venom thing that you think it is. That could be one thing that stops people. Um, the public interest of reptiles. Some people, at least back in that time, and even now it's kind of hard because some reptiles don't get the attention they deserve. Mm -hmm. Other thing too, dangerous predators so to go even in a zoo situation and try to get this animal to open its mouth head on something and try to extract venom from it that's not very easy they're very strong um they grow between seven and ten feet in length and can be i believe around 150 pounds they're very strong animals and can very much hurt someone even by accident so when you kind of put that all together you kind of you can kind of start to understand why it took so long to figure it out and it's also been proposed that other monitor lizards can so like maybe not as strong so like even if i had like a tiny a tiny aki monitor right they're like what how long are they like 24 inches long so it's about two feet long would they also like potentially possess these venom glands no i don't don't call me on it it's possible um again i i haven't read too far into it and i to be honest like i said i don't think the studies are really even there to show if some of these more common monitors that people see have venom or not mm -hmm. um so don't call me on that one um Right with the Komodo dragon, uh, I'll actually show off one of my other skulls. This is this is a real skull. This isn't a replica. Wow. Um, it's very bleached. This Do is... they bleach it before, like, beforehand? No, we don't. We don't bleach it. We use another. It's another chemical process. Um, basically, it's called degreasing. So any animal, or it's it's a funny name, but any animal or any uh, even humans, when we die, our oil, uh, there's oil in our bones, natural yeah. fatty lipids that are in our bones that can make it a. a a yellowish to almost orange color. But what degreasing does, the process of that is using a chemical process that doesn't harm the bone, but mm -hmm. takes those out. Um, so this guy is a crocodile monitor. This is Varanus salvadori. Um, they're from Papua New Guinea. And if you can even tell, I'll show you. You can even tell just from comparing these two that the teeth are not the same. Moto dragon has long teeth, but when you like compare them to one for one, the crocodile monitor has incredibly long teeth and they live very different lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So the Komodo dragons are gonna be terrestrial reptiles. They're gonna be walking on land when they're uh, when they're young, they usually live up in the trees, but when they're adults, they're, they're too heavy and usually too bulky to be able to climb trees like they used to. Mm -hmm. um, these guys are arboreal. So they live up in the trees and sort of the proposed idea is because these guys have such long teeth, it's to catch birds, lizards, bats, animals that usually try to get away from you by jumping branch to branch, flying away, jumping into the water that's below the branch line. Mm -hmm. So in order to catch prey that's very slippery and tries to get away very quickly, you want to have these long teeth that are going to catch whatever you grab and not let it go. So yikes. They're, they're, intense. they're intense. Yeah. I've um, actually seen in, some in the... videos of them in captivity. Like I think there's like one dude who breeds them in Florida. Um, and oh, man, I'm, sure got... I'm sure there's a guy. I'm sure there's a guy who breeds a lot of different animals in Florida. <laughs> I mean, it was on it was on uh, Camp Cannon, and it... freaking he got bitten by his pet oh, croc yeah. monitor because he was trying to separate the male from the female, and his hand was that's... jacked up, like so bad. Yeah, so that that's that's Tom Crutchfield. He's worked with go. reptiles for for years, like literal years. Um, he's kind of like a pinnacle, or at least a very well-known person in the reptile hobby. I know you keep reptiles, and I, I've kept reptiles in the past. Um, I still keep up to date with things going on in the reptile hobby. But yeah, so cardinal monitors, they can be kept in the reptile hobby. They're not very easy to take care of, and they're what, you know, right now, they're very difficult to breed for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to figure them out. Um, but there's just not a lot of these animals just in the market. And even if they were common in the market, you really don't want 10 year old kids buying croc monitors because one, why not? <laughs> and the size requirements for them, you really do need an entire room for them. They need a lot of space and they like to climb. So you need vertical, horizontal width. You need all of it to house one of these guys. So again, just 
something were to go wrong, even by accident, they have intense teeth. Like that Tom Crutchfield, unfortunately, like he has minor nerve damage from that. Like yeah. it's and that was just a nip. They're intense. Do are they obviously animals that still think and have um conscience? Yeah, of course they do. And sometimes accidents happen, which is why we have to be careful with any type of species that we work with, from an Aki monitor, like you said, to something more intense, like a crocodile monitor or a Komodo dragon. Hmm. <laughs> that's very okay. Yeah, that's that's actually pretty interesting. How would you compare their intelligence to say, like a human being, like Brannids, let's say, like the biggest ones, like Komodo dragons, and like? Oh, we're in, if you want me to go into like some Indominus Rex type of stuff? <laughs> 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 it kill it, it's killing for sport. Can they, can they open can they open doors? Can they camouflage like a cuttlefish? I mean I know um, they can annoyingly so like open enclosures <laughs> if it's not like yeah, so well turn, yeah. go go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so in so in terms of like intelligence, um I have a friend who's a zookeeper. He's worked with both Komodo dragons and crocodile mars. So first of all I'll talk about just them as uh, them together. Mm -hmm. uh, personally they he believes that the crocodile monitors are more intelligent than the Komodos, or at least in terms of like interactions, feeding, and uh, different uh, stimuli and working with them. Really? The reason being, the reason being is that, well, you would think the larger animal is more intelligent. That's what I was thinking um, too, yeah. Even, and even intelligence is, intelligence is hard to really interact with animals. But um, what he was saying was that when you put food in front of a Komodo dragon, really goes straight for it and the reason is it also has to do with just the different lives that they live and i'll put it into perspective like this Komodo dragons live in an area where the, the they are the top predator the only other predator that really eats komodo dragons are other komodo dragons so to put that into perspective when one adult komodo dragon makes a kill of a pig or a deer or a water buffalo mm. you don't have a lot of time until more komodo start coming and then you start to go into this feeding frenzy mode where all these animals are trying to eat and get their fill. Mm -hmm. Crocodile monitors are different. They live in arboreal lifestyle and really the chance of if the, the prey is smaller. So if this thing eats a bird, it's going to eat that bird by itself. The smell isn't going to wave off into the distance and the crocodile monitors are just going to start coming out of nowhere from the trees, which would be a crazy movie idea. <laughs> but um, They came from the trees. Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> so um, for crocodile monitors, they put, I, I have heard that they put more thought into their actions. Mm -hmm. They put more, they look at you in a way where they're really assessing the situation. Which I'm not saying that Komodo dragons don't think before they act and they don't assess. And even, even for people to hear this for the very first time, assess, it's kind of like, what do you mean by that? Well, they sort of look and they observe and then they make actions after. Let's say I'm putting um, a dead rat in front of a Komodo dragon. They may just go straight for it. Mm -hmm. If I put a rat, mm -hmm. uh, a dead rat in front of a crocodile monitor, it may look at the rat, they may look at me, they look back at the rat and then figure out what it wants to do, whether it wants to come and get the rat and eat it, or it wants to get away from me and get its space. It's like, what the, it, the hell's it's this? It's, I want a filet mignon. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds crazy to think about, but that's, that's what I've heard. And not just from him, from other sources as well. It, it's, it's just a different level of assessing intelligence, inquisitiveness. Um, again, like I said, Komodo dragons are intelligent, but I've spoken with crocodile monitors have something different about them. They're very observant and visually acute. So those are just some differences that you would see in terms of human intelligence. Well, uh, Komodo dragons and croc monitors haven't built a society yet, so we're good so far. We're good so far. They're not going to take over. We're not going to have Rise of the Planet of the the Varanids. Oh man, that would be a good movie too. <laughs> be a terrifying movie. They have venom. They're like hyper intelligent. They have claws. I mean, my blue tongue yeah, skinks no. already like scratch my hands up. Like I have scars on my hands just from my skinks yeah. walking on me. And I know that at least like from my friends who have like other kinds of losers like Lacertas and um, you know Varanids mm -hmm. that like just like oh, for example, just their Aki walking on their hands just it just hurts. <laughs> just straight yeah. up hurts because they're hooking into you with those sharp sharp tree climbing claws, right? And yes. Yeah, so yeah, and you should yeah, you should definitely whenever you get the chance, you should look at the claws on croc monitors and komodos. They're they're intense. And obviously for an arboreal lifestyle, arboreal animals usually have sharper, longer claws, and that's to help them climb a tree and um 
access that environment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're again, going to your question of back to relative to human intelligence, um, for them and the trainings that I know that people do with them, they have done um, like a pulley system, like they'll actually have like this sort of, um, what am I looking for? Um, they'll hang, they'll hang meat up on a, on a rig and then they'll let it play with it. So it'll go back and forth and then you'll see the Komodo sort of like stop for a moment. Mm -hmm. It'll see them go back and forth. And when the meat comes back towards them, that's when they try to bite. Interesting. Crazy. Interesting. So when this, the meat's swinging back and forth and it goes away, they stop. But when it comes back, they start to rear up and get ready and then try to bite at it. I've seen it on video happen. It's an, it's crazy to think about. It's some Jurassic Park um, stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, too, is that with Komodo dragons, they have proposed um, a proposed idea of that they've noticed play behavior in Komodos. Mm -hmm. Play behavior. Play. Um, so the idea was they put different um, enrichment items in the Komodo dragon enclosure before the Komodo dragon went in. Mm -hmm. Then had the Komodo go in the enclosure, and it got to see all of these different um, items, and it kind of toyed with things with its nose and um, put some things around. But the one thing that people noticed, the keepers noticed, was they put a bucket in there. Put a bu uh, just a regular um, sort of metal bucket. It wasn't very big. And what it would do is it would have the bucket, and it would go put its head inside, lift it up, then put it down, and it would drop on the ground. Mm -hmm. would then do the exact same thing put its nose in the bucket go up drop it and it would just keep doing that over and over and over and they were wondering why why would a komodo dragon just put its head in a bucket pick it up put it back down and let it drop on the ground and keep doing that over and over and over there wasn't any food in it it had no scent of food whatsoever and it just kept doing it so the idea was maybe it's play behavior maybe this animal is actually Finding some level of enjoyment with this, or to put it in an evolutionary sort of perspective, and Komodo dragons usually bury their heads deep into the carcasses of animals. Mm -hmm. So this animal could have been, I don't really want to say the word practicing, but could have put their head in the bucket, similar to a natural behavior they do in the wild to go inside the body of a carcass, mm -hmm. and just kept doing that and doing that and doing that. So crazy. So all sorts of crazy stuff. And I, I love it. I love learning about this stuff. Animal behavior is one of the one things that I I love. I love learning about this stuff. Mm -hmm. So could it be play behavior? Maybe. Could it not be? I don't know. But it's definitely food for thought and things to consider when we start ass assessing intelligence of animals. So obviously this is a very obviously. controversial topic among like herpetologists, I'm guessing. Yeah, I would say. You know, it's it's hard because for the general public, like I care a lot about teaching the general public about things. Obviously, we have friends that are, you know, work in actual labs and are paleontologists. And I obviously I want when I do my post, like I want to do something that um, fits that media so that we make it something they enjoy. But I'm also thinking about the general public, simplifying terms, helping get that food for thought out, because you and I can have a discussion about dinosaurs or animals, but a general person, the soccer mom with her kids, the kid who's barely learning about dinosaurs, this is all new to them. Mm -hmm. So for me, again, it's going back to sort of simplifying terms and making things more easier to explain. But yeah, could it be play behavior? I don't know. It's definitely possible. Okay. I know that there's the reports of this behavior in like crocodiles too, like crocodiles using like the, like a river as like a water slide or something like that. You're just referencing that meme I sent you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I swear to God. Like, okay, I'm like, like, okay. you know, you know, um, Dino Keeper Aiden, right? I'm assuming you guys know each other. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, he invited me to like one of his Discord servers and in there they were discussing play behavior of reptiles. And one of the examples okay. is, um, yeah, the, what do you call this? The, the crocodiles like you know being observed you know going down the slide crocodiles playing with beach balls for some reason but then obviously no, we can't no, measure would, that right no i would definitely say that's play behavior like it's it's enrichment so with so i also again like i know people from zoos in the zoo world that's in, that's enrichment like if you get a crocodilian and that's that's the other thing too it's a whole topic on its own is reptile enrichment a lot of animals like tigers and gorillas and these charismatic mammals, they get a lot of enrichment. They get a lot of attention to that because we associate these animals with a very intelligent, we need to keep their minds stimulated. 
the sad part and it's hard because a lot of reptiles are very intelligent or, or more intelligent than we project them to be and sometimes they don't always get the enrichment that they deserve mm -hmm. so when you mentioned the beach ball and then like smacking their head around with it and playing with it, i've seen that myself i i agree that's enrichment and that's actual behavior that they're doing mm -hmm. so um I definitely think it's real. There was um, another a study that went by that they were saying that crocodilians would get twigs and leaves and put it on top of their snout. Mm -hmm. So when birds would come by or other animals would come by to either get water or birds would come to get nesting material like twigs, it would be on their face and they would eat the birds from there. Um, there's been some real controversy about that. Um, I don't know if it's been debunked or still supported, but there's been a lot of back and forth on that one. Um, but that's just one example. and. Again, there's a lot of controversy with how we assess it. intelligence. There's, I feel like there's always going to be, um, but I really think we're in a wave of getting people involved with reptile intelligence. And it's not just reptiles that I like, too. I don't want people to just think like, oh, you're the crocodile and Komodo dragon guy. Like, you only like reptiles. No, I love mammals. I love, that's my draft spot right there. I love <laughs> mammals, birds, and fish, invertebrates. I love a little bit of everything. And that's mm -hmm. why I try to make my posts really diverse. If you go through, you're going to see reptiles, mammals, birds, and vertebrates, and all sorts of stuff, because I don't, I don't really want to be a specialized person. I think it's cool. I think the, the, definitely the two groups that I spend the most time on are reptiles and mammals, mm -hmm. but I want to continue to learn. I want to continue to figure out how arthropods work and how fish work and all these different new species because as I learn and grow, I'm helping other, other people learn and grow. And that's all part of what I want to do. No, same same here. No, I 100% agree. Um, regarding that, like, what do you think are some like controversial things that people are not aware of within these, like, like, you know, within wildlife education, within like the reptile field or within like, you know, the mammal, like, is it mammalogy? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah it really is mammalogy okay i was like i was like i hope i'm not bsing <laughs> a term out here you're saying like what's something that doesn't like get shed a lot of light on or yeah what does it get shed a lot of light on or what is like something that a lot of researchers argue about i think i mean i think the intelligence thing it's really it's again because it's so hard to it's hard to assess um i would another i would also say uh, not really welfare. Welfare is pretty distinct now. So animal, um, and I, when I say welfare, I'm not, um, I'm not talking about like PETA and animal rights. There's a distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. Animal welfare is something that uh, zoos actually measure. It's on a scale and it can constantly change on um, when a zoo builds an enclosure, the animal they put in it, the enrichment that they have, the stresses, the, the types of stresses that are put on the animal. Um, and what I mean by stress is not always a negative thing. It's Stress could be defined as putting a beach ball in the crocodile's enclosure. That could be something that they're playing with and actually enjoying. I can't really strictly say enjoy, but um, that's something that's actually measured by zoos. That's animal welfare. Um, I feel like, nah, that's, I wouldn't say that's very controversial. I think the intelligence thing is probably the big thing because with reptiles and snakes and all these different, and fish really, fish kind of get the breath of that, and arthropods like spiders and scorpions and all sorts of invertebrates. It's it's hard, like where do we begin to start assessing how can this thing solve problems? How can this thing do this? But we're assessing that as a human. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that comic of, it's like a really old black and white comic of, okay, you guys have to climb this tree and it's an elephant, a seagull, a monkey, and like some other animals and obviously out of all those animals that are going to climb the tree the monkey is going to succeed because it's built to climb a tree mm -hmm. I've seen elephants that yeah, so the elephant's going to look dumb because it can't climb a tree but um that's a really old but really relevant kind of way to describe it because when we think of the intelligence of animals it's going back to like what we think of pre-consciously as humans so Mm -hmm. um, again, I think we're getting better with it with the 21st century and just moving forward um, with more studies and ideas, but I still think we need to put more into it and not just reptiles, it's fish and invertebrates. So it's just, that's just something I would like to see more um, interest and time put into. Mm -hmm. One thing, okay, one thing I've wondered, and I want your opinion on this, like, what is your opinion on certain, like, things within the reptile, like, community? I, I know you just said you're not all about reptiles, but I just, this is something that I wanted another opinion on. Oh, yeah. um, for example, like, morphs, breeding morphs, 
or breeding um Great. you know morphs with neurological problems like for example the the ball python i think it's called the spider ball python exactly what you're talking about spider ball python i know exactly what you're talking about yeah so like i said i don't keep reptiles anymore i don't have any pets but i still keep up with the reptile hobby and know a good amount of people still in it mm -hmm. um actually i have a podcast i'll recommend to you later that i think you'll really like okay. but um so so when it comes to like hobby the reptile hobby there's a few things to keep in mind um with morphs i'll start with morphs so for morphs um so for anyone who doesn't know morphs is a reference to actually sort of like how dogs how we try to line breed them to make a white coat or a black coat or a brown coat with some dogs um this is now taking reptiles and sort of breeding them for certain traits like a bearded dragon sometimes bearded dragons can be yellow with some orange stripes but let's say one person has the idea i want to turn it really orange so now this person starts breeding bearded dragons that are very orange and you're basically building a line of these animals that are very very orange now um, because that's a selective breeding trait um, sometimes you get things out of nowhere like albino so now we'll move on to ball pythons ball pythons are well known in the reptile hobby because they have really hundreds of color morphs so uh coloration types um and that's with the genes that build up build them up with their dna um just build build up their makeup basically so you have an albino animal okay so now this animal is lacking melanin which is dark pigment so usually that's pretty much fine but usually or with some of these sort of color mutations morphs sometimes there's some setbacks there's some things that can happen when you start messing with some of those genetics okay. the spider ball python for example is this this ball python that has a black sort of web look on its body for anyone who doesn't know the trade-off that they found is that you have this ball python that has the spider web pattern on its back but they've noticed that there's some neurological issues meaning that when the snake slithers it sometimes slithers it turns its head upside down or it has a wobbly head it's not it's not really right Personally, I don't believe that should be done. If you can manage to change the color of an animal without any physical setbacks, I think that's okay. If you start tinkering a little too much into something where it's literally trying to slither upside down. I don't, I don't agree with that. Because then, because I mean, again, that comes from how what I know about zoos and people that I work with um, goes into animal welfare. This animal welfare, this animal that has that's crooking its body abnormally, that's I wouldn't put that on a high scale for welfare. So um, do I think morphs are okay? Yeah. But as long as they're conscious of the animal's health as a whole. Um, if we move on to another topic in the reptile hobby, enclosure size. That's oh, a big thing to me. Yeah, that's oh, a big, that's a big controversial one, that's a, one for me. Yeah, here's your bit of dragon. Yeah, All right, so, just stuff them in a 30 gallon, you're good, man. You're good. <laughs> Yeah. Man, I've seen people be smaller than 30 gallons, so Jesus. it's hard. I mean, enclosure enclosure size, like, I think that's something that a lot of people need to think about. And I think, too, it's hard, too, because a lot of these animal experts, like uh, pet store experts, I won't say names, usually sell these kits of this is the gallon tank you're going to get, this is the heat lamp you're going to get, and you're good. You're good for this animal's whole life. No, you're not. Like, there's a lot of research that needs to get done. And I think from like the 80s to the or 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot of people brought up that idea that reptiles are cheap and inexpensive. And you can just go like for your for Timmy's birthday, his 10th birthday, you can go get him a Savannah monitor. That's that's a fun little pet. It's not. It's not. It's not at all. So this Timmy gets his Savannah monitor that his that his relative bought for 30 bucks. This is a wild caught animal that probably has parasites in its body because it was caught from the wild and it's going to eventually grow to be three three and a half feet mm -hmm. and that's not a good situation so closure size um well going back to enclosure size i think that's huge because you need to you need to care about the animal space and again even going further back that goes back to what i know about zoos and animal welfare so things to sort of keep in mind if you are going to get a pet any pet dog cat People get dogs, but work a nine to five job and put the dog either in the backyard all day, inside the house all day, or in a crate all day. Things to consider. So that's horrible. Yeah, no, it's, it's all right. 
I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not trying to throw shade on anyone. I swear. So anyone have has a dog or a cat, I'm not trying to throw shade, but just consider that. Like before you get this new pet for your ten year old kid for his birthday, whether it's a dog, a reptile, anything, do you have the time to spend to that? Is your kid really gonna put the time into that? Which you're, you're a parent. You're like you're gonna have to assess that. Sometimes parents are the ones that take care of it, and the kids are the ones that get to play with it and spend time with it. So. Your schedule doesn't really work around this animal's life, this living, breathing animal that's going to exist for a certain amount of years. You got to keep all that in mind. That's why right now I don't have pets. I'm a regular guy. I work two jobs besides all the social media stuff. So right now I don't have the time for pets, unfortunately. They're cool. I love animals, but I know I've assessed enough that with what I do and the schedule that I have, I can't have pets right now. I'm not ready for that. I feel it. I think that's something that children, <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that children, adults, and a lot of people just need to consider before they get any pet, reptile, mammal, fish, anything. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree. I don't know if you know this. I used to work at a Petco. Did I ever tell you that? Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so, we're, name, we're, we're name dropping now? Okay. <laughs> I, can, I can name drop Petco, whatever. I used to work there. I don't care. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of YouTubers already talk about my work at Petco or my work at GameStop. This is, you know, I mean, okay, they're <laughs> GameStop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, okay, so no, I, that's we tried our best to give them. At least I tried because I was also helping take care of the animals, and I tried to, my best to give like you know the animals the best that they could have. The reptiles got pretty nice enclosures but you know I, I had i didn't have that much control over the heat i didn't have that much control over humidity i mean i try to make for example for some of like the more humid animals like the uh, chinese water dragon i tried to give it as much humidity as i could but we would only do this like twice a day and obviously with a chinese water dragon you need more than just a water bowl for it to swim in it needs like a, a whole filtered you know waterfall not a waterfall but you know like water system no, going yeah. on i can't give that to it um, and I guess that's the cost of, you know, commercial pet, you know, stuff. Also, like, a lot of the the pamphlets that we had were straight up BS. They didn't really tell, like, like yeah, you can keep, okay. you, you can keep an adult. Pamphlets, man. I've read them. <laughs> you can keep an adult leopard gecko in, like, a five Don't gallon. get me on those pamphlets, man. I've read them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, you, oh, you want a leopard gecko? Yeah, here's the little, what do you call this? The little, like, box thing you can use, like, keep bugs for transport yeah you go you put a little lamp on top of it you're good man like no that's terrible they don't need uvb <laughs> yeah uh and then and even um another topic from the reptile hop that i want that i don't think people are really abusing it but i think for people who are watching this podcast right now this this stream when you get a reptile or any animal you want to buy captive bread you don't want to buy sure. a wild caught animal getting Timmy, well, just say Timmy, getting Timmy that $30 Savannah monitor. Unfortunately, Savannah monitors and a lot of reptiles are wild caught. They are gone from the wild, they're brought in, shipped into the US, and then they're sold as pets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not throwing shit on anyone. There's mm -hmm. people, there's people who import, there's people who export. You're gonna do what you gotta do. But um, for any person watching this who wants to get a savanna monitor or any type of Asian water monitor, different types of snakes, mm -hmm. I would very much recommend doing your research on where you get that animal from. If you want a ball python, there are a lot of breeders, people who actually, like a dog breeder, but not like a puppy mill, don't get me wrong here, people who actually take care of these animals and breed them with the right causes that sell them to you to have a good quality pet. If you go to Again, like I said, this imported animal, you don't know the life it's lived. Just getting to you in general. They could have parasites in their body. That's another, that's vet bills that you have to pay because your animal is now sick and has parasites in its body. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And you're working on losing this animal into a three, three and a half foot animal that needs a very large enclosure. So it really just comes down to make sure you do your research before you get any pet. Um, Ah, just things that are going to fit your lifestyle. Um, if you see an animal that says it's wild caught, I would strongly recommend not purchasing that animal and looking up online resources to find maybe that animal you really want, but captive bred or a different animal that's just as awesome mm -hmm. and maybe fits your lifestyle better and they're captive bred. So that's something to keep, again, just plenty of things to keep in mind. I mean, oh, so Skink of Death has a question. What about for breeders? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm assuming he means that like, is it 
okay for breeders to import wild caught reptiles in order to um, diversify their um, you know genetic stock. Yeah, and some, sometimes that happens. Like there, like in the U.S., there are some species where, unfortunately, like we don't have a lot of. Uh, I'll go to the crocodile monitors, for example. Like crocodile monitors, are very large. They can potentially be threatening or hurt you, but for whatever reason, we haven't figured out how to really breed them successfully. Um, I don't know the details. There are plenty of people who try to breed crocodile monitors that don't really know the details, but they a lot of them do happen to be imported wild caught animals. Um, some are actually some are born in captivity, like Indonesia or Papua New Guinea, and then brought to the U.S. Um, but to try to not not try to not to make it so muddy, um, yeah. Just the bottom line: just try to consider where you're getting your animals from, and try to just do the research. Do the research on a lot of things. That's all it takes. We have computers in our pocket, and I'm gonna sound like, a but we have computers in our pocket. Like we can look these up. On we have technology. All it takes is just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We have technology. We can look these things up and figure it out. Um, yeah, that's really in sum what I would say about the reptile hobby. And I love the reptile hobby. I think people are great and there's plenty of amazing people. Um, and again, like I said, I'm not trying to throw any bad juju on anyone or anything about the hobby. I think it's great. Um, but I just think before getting any pet reptile, considering the size of Closure, all of these different things have that all in mind before you say I want a bearded dragon or I want a crocodile monitor as a pet no for sure and I, I agree 100% gonna get any pet do your research we get anything do your research get a computer do your research man like you know um yeah no I mean like there's you know I've had my share of like dumb customer stories when I used to work at Petco there was this one lady um and she <laughs> She's returning a tur a, a red-eared slider at a turtle, and I was like, "Oh, okay. and, you know." And I look at the receipt; they had it for a week. And I was like, "Oh, ma'am, why are you returning this turtle?" <laughs> you know, I was uh, letting my son play with it, and he put it in his mouth, and no one told me that these things have salmonella. Like, this is not the animal's oh fault. Boy. This is not my fault. Yeah. This is your fault for letting your son put this turtle, an aquatic animal that pees and poops in its you know in its water enclosure, putting this turtle in its mouth. But, you know, ah. it's like, oh, my God, like, you know, some people are really dumb. Like, oh, my God, there's one dude who asked if cats drink water, if, <laughs> yeah. if cats need to drink water. Sir, if you need to ask me Boy. that question, <laughs> you you shouldn't be owning any animal. You shouldn't even have a child. You know, you shouldn't have anything in your care. Maybe not even a computer. Like, <laughs> for real, like, that's like a basic question for life yeah. in general. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and... Like for me, like my first snake was a Brazilian rainbow boa. For most people, that's not an entry level snake. Did I do a heck load of research before I got it? I did. They need a lot of humidity. They need heat. They need X amount of requirements. Um, it was a great animal. I ended up, I ended up just, you know, I gave it to someone else because again, my schedule got busier. But it was a great animal. I loved, I love Brazilian rainbow boas, but they're not an entry level pet by any means. For sure. So some, some, some pets that usually get circulated are big constrictors like reticulated pythons and Burmese pythons or monitor lizards, things that are big and impressive. But again, you have to consider they need space, they need food, like to buy, if you're going to feed a Burmese python, you need jumbo rats to rabbits. That gets expensive very quickly. Even if you're feeding it once every two weeks or sometimes once a month, that's still expensive. You're buying a whole um, deceased rabbit. That's a lot. So been uh, tortoises some people will think oh this this little baby sulcata spurt thigh tortoise is super cute i really want it and this little sulcata spurt thigh spurt thigh tortoise grows to the size of a small coffee table when it's an adult and could live outlive you so what are you going to do with it when this yeah. animal gets to the size of one of a small coffee table and two and you're getting old and you need to find a new home for it just long-term thoughts because these are long-term investments these are living breathing things mm -hmm. so yeah, going back to the whole the moral of the story is just to consider do your research <laughs> um oh so gamer chimp is asking any advice on how to pick up wild blue tongues a lot of cross a lot cross the road here in australia and i want to stop them getting run over okay so he's saying um 
how to grab them or how, how to like how to grab them to safely like take them off the road to put them to the side of the road so they don't get run over yeah okay so for those who don't know in australia unfortunately they they do have a bit of a roadkill problem there's a lot of species where these areas have roads where a lizard may pass by a snake passes by sometimes unfortunately a kangaroo may pass by and they get hit by a car sometimes the animal survives fully fine sometimes they don't when it comes to reptiles and particularly a blue tongue skink um i would say if you are trying to move a blue tongue sometimes they're very, they can be really chill sometimes they can be defensive and they'll want to posture and open their mouth i would just say if you have the lizard kind of go under behind the tail and uh, you want your hand on the stomach kind of lift up gently and then get it to the side of the road a little bit so keep that in mind um but if you're going to try to grab this animal you usually want to go under under the tail under its stomach hold it gently try to get it to the side of the road and you're good from there yeah, they'll, they'll poop on you, so be aware of that. Yeah, they could poop. And sometimes they may, sometimes they're really chill. But sometimes they, they'll posture up. They may try to do like a quick little lunge um, to try to bite you. But uh, be careful. But try to be gentle and get them to the side of the road. So, so Christian, what animals have you kept like in the past, like personally, besides the Brazilian oh, uh, rainbow boa? Oh man, it's been a lot. I've had a lot of pets growing up. And there's just part of my, like, just growing up liking animals. I've had fish. I've had um, those, like, silver sharks. You know, you worked at Petco now, so I know. Yeah. You have those silver sharks that are really small. And yeah. But get really big. The whole thing about the, like, not, not um, fish hobby, but, like, Petco and PetSmart, they don't, they don't make it very clear the investment you're making on fish too, because I feel like, I feel bad for fish because they get That's really true. like yeah. disposable, disposable. It's hard. I mean, look at Placos. Um, Placo, like, oh my God, I, I have so much algae in my tank because I don't have a filter. What do I do? Don't worry, just get a Placo. And then, you know, they, you think they're going to stay like this yeah. small forever. They get up to like four feet long. <laughs> yeah, I fell into that trap. Oh, I, got, I got a flat coach for as a son sucker fish and that thing got big <laughs> but i've had i've had uh, i had paku i had i had, you had a paku like, uh, relatives of i had the relatives of piranha so you have piranhas which a lot of folks should know then there's pakus and pakus look like piranhas uh, some of them live an omnivorous or herbivorous diet but they got big and i had to give them away to um a, a fish shop because they got too big for me to keep them um, but yeah, I had them for a short period of time. I had those silver sh silver sharks that got too big for me too. Um, I have goldfish. Um, I've never had birds. I never had a cat. I had rabbits. I've had a guinea pig. I had one dog. Only one dog. Um, and then from there, it was a leopard, a leopard gecko, two bearded dragons. I've had three snakes. It was the Brazilian rainbow boa, um, a type of uh, boa constrictor that was about maybe like six foot five foot six foot and uh the one that i loved the most i loved him so much but unfortunately he passed away he was a what's called a super dwarf reticulated python dang so you got a super dwarf knows, so so for anyone who knows what reticulated pythons are they're the longest snake in the world they can grow up to 20 plus feet they're very large although where they live in southeast asia there are some smaller islands where you have what they call dwarf and super dwarf. That's just the title that they give. So these animals are used to make smaller island ranges that are near the, the, the big reticulated pythons. They live on the mainland of South Asia. These dwarf and super dwarfs usually live on these smaller islands that pick up near Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. I had with a super dwarf. So usually these guys grow, instead of 20 feet, they grow from My my guy, he didn't get to be his adult because he, he had passed, but he was about, I say three, four feet long. He was awesome. He was like he was so intelligent and inquisitive. I would open the enclosure and he would go up, look at like I wouldn't say he was looking at me, but he would go up, kind of look at what was going on, wait it, and then he would just kind of slither against like the rim of the enclosure and just kind of hang out. Mm -hmm. He was so great. I loved him. His name his name was, Bar his name was Barak. Um, so I'm, I'm part Middle Eastern. I'm part. I'm part. I'm part Middle Eastern. So okay. um, his name was Barak. So um, in I believe in Arabic it means uh, noble. So that I just I was I was like 13 at the time. I thought it was cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, his name was Barak. He was he was he was my favorite snake that I've had. He was so great. But yeah, unfortunately he he 
he passed away. I wasn't sure what the cause was. He was getting fed. He was getting water. The temperatures were right, but unfortunately, I just I just wasn't sure what happened. And I didn't I didn't have the money as a as a teenager to get him to the vet and figure out what happened. So uh, that's just what happened to I'm my sorry. favorite reptile. But, yeah, that's right. No, it always sucks when like an animal dies. Like one of my first um, my beardy like you know passed away. I wasn't sure why. Maybe he had a high parasite load. Maybe it was something off. Um, and you know, obviously, I, I was a broke college kid. I didn't. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we're gonna be best friends forever. Like my my leopard geckos have actually outlived him, and they're doing really well still. But yeah, it's always a bummer when like a, you know you don't know why. Mm, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. That, that's because then you, you as a keeper, as a person who's like really love this animal, you do ask yourself like, what happened? Was it something that was it something I could have controlled? Cause then that that starts to get to you you know yeah hard because he wasn't old yeah. he wasn't he didn't reach his old age so yeah for i was thinking about like like dang what happened like i feel i feel bad but i mean it is what it is so kind of move forward from there i feel it um <laughs> yeah but some paleo stuff dude we talked a lot about modern animals I don't know. let's talk about some paleo stuff all right um, dinosaurs what are you uh, into man Late on me. Uh, so, when it comes to just man, we're gonna we're gonna repeat on some stuff. So, when it comes to prehistoric life, um, the animals I really seem to get drawn to, like dinosaur wise, my favorite dinosaur is T Rex, which I'm drawing right now. Um, my <laughs> favorite, everyone's favorite group, dinosaur. My favorite group of dinosaurs. Uh huh. My favorite group of dinosaurs are the Tyrannosaurus. So all the way from D Long and Gualong, all the way to the larger ones like Tarbosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Despletosaurus, all of them. So I think they're really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I like sauropods. I think sauropods are really neat. Um, other dinosaur groups can't think of anything on the top of my head, but I really but sauropods and Tyrannosaurus have really been like the two groups that I like the most. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of like extinct mammals, I really like. I really, I really like proboscideans. I like elephants. Their whole family. Um, modern modern elephants and extinct elephants. Um, one one thing I did with Julio Lacerda, you can find on my Instagram at Greg Gets Christian. I got a plug. Um, you'll see we did um, a post about Paleoloxodon nematicus, which oh, is I remember as that. Far I as remember we, that. <laughs> yeah, it was I, I, man. I love that one. So um, Paleoloxodon nematicus was, as far as we know, could have been one of the one of if not, not the largest mammal to ever exist. So the current largest extinct mammal is Paraceratherium. It's for, it's a, a rhino relative. Mm -hmm. Paleoloxodon nematicus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we only have a few. We only have a few remains of Paleoloxodon nematicus. There's not many. So what we know, based off measurements and people who are much smarter than me, have figured out that this this elephant relative could have possibly been, again, like I said, one of the largest, if not one of the heaviest mammals to ever exist on land on our planet well, how big was it I, I can't get the measurements off the top of my head but it was i think someone said it was almost twice the weight of an african elephant don't don't quote me on that one because i'm trying to think on the top of my head it was it was big i don't know if you watched lord of the rings but the like giant elephants that they like, use as, like those, battle the, tanks, the, the giant like, the war elephants oh my god the closest thing we'll ever have like Paleoloxodon nematicus is like the closest thing we'll have to like those Lord of the Rings battle elephants. Like it's so awesome. That's super. That's super dope. Dang. Um. Yeah, that's one of my. That's one of my. Oh, oh, go ahead. I'm. I'm. I think I'm pretty. I, I guess I won't say basic. I mean, like my favorite dinosaur is Miragaya, because I think it's a very elegant looking dinosaur. Oh. You know, it's a very oh, civilized yeah. looking dinosaur. It's very you know. That one. It's one of those dinosaurs. Freaking when, when treat you... that one so well, dude. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, when when you say when you say I don't know I feel like it's like it's kind of like when you say Mira guy is your favorite dinosaur it's like it's like bringing out like the finest wine to party. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah I like Mira guy. It's been aged for X amount of years. <laughs> it's been made from X amount of years. Yeah. Um, my favorite groups. It's hard because I don't have a specific favorite group. I mean, I. I always root for like underdog dinosaurs. I guess if I had to choose a very specific favorite group, I guess like you know basal silurosaurs. Like I really like Compsognathans specifically. Yeah. I think they're cute. You know they're like little chickens with tails. Yeah. 
And they have like you know cool feathers, cool feather integuments. We know a lot about them, like Sinusoropterics, you know, the colorization the coloration, we know like a lot about like how potentially live, where it's from. You know, just stuff like that. Um yeah. I guess if I had a favorite herbivore group, it might be sauropods, but it's really hard for me to really pinpoint like I really, really like this specific group. It's more like a specific yeah. like dinosaur for me. When it comes to mammals. I'm not I'm not a huge mammal person, I'm sorry. Um yeah, I like them. If I had to choose, mm-hmm. probably Paraceratherium because because I'm basic like that, I guess. <laughs> That's when yeah. you bring out the PBR. Yeah, I like Paraceratherium. <laughs> It's the PBR of mammal mammal yeah. choices. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not just... Um, sorry, I'm going to be right back. I have a freaking alarm on my, on my watch that I need to get right now. You're good. good. Go, go grab headphones. Because I can hear myself sometimes now. All right, guys. I'm just entertaining you guys by myself. Paris, Paris Ethereum is a Saturday um, afternoon I'm mammal. I can watch you. My watch has this timer that always goes off around the time. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, you're good, you're good. But yeah, it's not it's not just dinosaurs and extinct mammals. Like I like extinct reptiles. Like uh, actually, I don't, I don't even say megalania. Megalania gets too much hype. I'll say something more obscure. I like Paleocenula. A lot of people don't know that one. Is that the running like, crocodile? Paleocenula is a Paleocenula is an extinct lizard. We only have like fragmentary remains of the animal. Um, it was found in the Hell Creek Formation. Um, it's as far as they understand, it was most likely related to sort of like split in between monitor lizards and the helodermatids. So think beaded lizards and heel monsters. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of kind of in the mix of the two because they because uh helodermatidae and varanidae, which are monitor lizards and the beaded lizard and heel monster, are in relation to one another. So mm-hmm. Paleocenua is somewhere in that relation, and um, just this idea of like this. I don't really want to say, but like this sort of like amalgamation of a, a Gila monster and a Komodo dragon, because uh-huh. they 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 estimate they estimate it was around Komodo dragon size. So, what do you picture? Do you picture this Komodo dragon like animal, or do you picture a Gila monster ten feet long? Like that's so crazy. <laughs> also, okay, Reynold, thank you for yeah. gifting subs to people. I really appreciate that. Um. Yeah, no, no, okay, yeah. So I, I, I agree one hundred percent. Um dang, what what is what is my favorite obscure extinct reptile? I don't have to go too niche. It's alright, man. <laughs> I, I wanna be cool too, bro. I wanna be cool too, okay? I can't I can't be here like okay. I like Megalania because it's a big Komodo dragon. No, I can't do that. It's so basic, dude. Um <laughs> You can say like Trapanosaurus. Everyone likes Trapanosaurus. Trapanosaurus. I like Shringosaurus. I think that's a really cool one. The the fat, yeah, yeah. tiny head, horns, um, kind of cute. I like that oh, one. Yeah. yeah. Um, that one's that one's actually pretty neat. It's it's just a very strange animal. Um, if I had to yeah. choose like extinct, like crocodile, I like pur like Purosaurus. Is it? Oh yeah yeah yeah. The from um, South America, yeah. the Brazilian. Gatoroid? Is that what you say? Yeah. Alligatoroid? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a Cayman relative. So Perusosaurus, I forgot what exact time period. It's during the Cenozoic, so the age of mammals after the dinosaurs were extinct. Um, Perusosaurus is an, an extinct giant species of Cayman. Uh, the size estimates around thirty plus feet. So it's going to be with those like other large crocodilians like um, Asuchus and Sarcosuchus. So kind of. Archosuchus, Dinosuchus, and Perusosaurus are all kind of in the similar size range of like 30 plus feet. Mm-hmm. So they usually get grouped up together. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Why do you think these, why do you think we can't, we don't have any more like, you know, crocodilians that got that big? So, I mean, that goes into a whole like environmental, ecological sort of stance because when you think about, when you think about each one of these animals, and each one's actually a really great example because Sarcosuchus was during the Cretaceous period. Anasuchus was during the Cretaceous period. And Perusosaurus was after the dinosaurs went extinct in the Cenozoic. So what do these three have in common and what can they show us of how a crocodilian gets so large? So there really comes down to temperature and environment, resources like food and space, and 
just the right opportunity versus competition. So if you think about where Sarkozy did live in North Africa during the Cretaceous period, there were plenty of dinosaurs around that time. As far as we understand, there was only so many animals that really fit this niche of large, uh, large semi-aquatic or large aquatic reptile in where it lived. Mm -hmm. so you also have all these fish, lizards, dinosaurs that now big animals that fit that prey resource. Mm -hmm. You have a hot human, a hot human environment that helps reptiles grow. You have plenty of large prey items to eat, and the competition dinosaurs on land and i think it actually lived near spinosaurus as well so you have sort of similar competition but it it was enough leeway i'll just say leeway to allow sarcosuchus to grow and be so large dinosuchus it kind of was the apex predator in its environment mm -hmm. i actually know people who who oh for dinosuchus material dinosuchus fossil material i know individuals that go out and do it themselves mm -hmm. the dinosuchus in its environment Wait, is, it, is it easy to find or is it mainly just teeth i'm guessing oh um yeah i think they usually end up finding teeth they go uh it's in the aguja formation so the aguja formations in texas are texas i think this area um and from what i've heard dinosuchus kind of really was the top dog like it was one of the apex predators in the entire environment mm -hmm. so dinosuchus mm -hmm. again Think about the environment. It was the late Cretaceous. We have humid, hot, which is going to help reptiles grow. It was the, one of the top predators in the entire environment. The only the only competition that I know of that we found are some fragmentary tyrannosaur remains. So there was some type of tyrannosaur that lived during that time. But that's pretty much it. So you now have this whole semi-aquatic, aquatic, again, a, a niche is opening up for this giant crocodilian to take the reins. So Dinosuchus would have been eating large turtles, large fish, um, other crocodilians that were smaller than it. Mm -hmm. um, we even have fossil material mm -hmm. to show us that it ate dinosaurs. We have actual dinosaur remains from a ceratopsian dinosaur, a horned dinosaur, that have puncture marks that match the tooth shape and size of Dinosuchus. So we have everything basically mm -hmm. lining up it had space, environment, and the resources of food to be what it is. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Perusosaurus. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs are now extinct. So we now have this whole niche of giant apex predators out of the way. That's super now interesting. Now we move on to the Cenozoic. Okay. Yeah. So now we have the Cenozoic. Mammals are starting to evolve. They're, okay. getting, they're getting their footing. So they really have their footing for a while. Um, but again, my aquatic lifestyle for a big predatory animal to fill plenty of ground slots and different species for this animal to eat mm -hmm. warm humid environment We're basically it's this formula that's basically building up again and again and again for these three examples to fill the spots that they fill mm -hmm. basically just goes down to those three things now it can be more it can be much more complex than that um that's just kind of like the basic building blocks for just the kind of, again, the general public to kind of understand how these animals got so big. Mm -hmm. um, then when you start to move on to competition, now you have other, ant like now we think, think about now, caimans. Caimans are related to Perusosaurus. Okay. You have the black caiman. Black caimans can grow from six to 16 foot to the largest at 18 foot. But they can't get Perusosaurus size as far as we understand because their prey isn't large enough to fill themselves to feed that much the temperatures relative to that time the temperatures relative to that time have dropped a little bit so it's not as hot and um able to get the animals to grow so large and grow so rapidly um now we have competition because we have jaguars and giant river otters yes giant river otters are competition for black caiman um, <laughs> so we have jaguars and giant river otters and man all filling all time for resources in this area to now we're kind of limiting how animals can grow and get to Perusosaurus dinosuchus size. Again, people who are much smarter than me can break this down better. But that's, again, these are some sort of basic building blocks for anyone watching this to understand how normal size croc becomes very, very big croc. Mm. Now, now I know, and the more you know, <laughs> knowing is half the battle. 
<laughs> okay, okay. So now I yeah. I kind of understand better like why, because in my mind, you know, the whole time I was wondering like, you know, okay, first of all, we got these these big ass like crocodiles. They they'd be like they're unbeatable, man. They're like walking tanks with like you know teeth that like you know can regrow and stuff, and then they just disappear. Yeah. And then they like you're telling me like this gi- you know giant parasuchus right or parasaurus turn into this tiny caiman like yeah, yeah. aren't caimans like the smallest crocodilian group right now um yeah i would say so i mean we have we have two species of alligator we have x amount of crocodiles the taxonomy on crocodiles is still getting figured out right now and then we have six caiman right now um, taxonomy evolves a lot so um out of all of those caiman most of them are usually between five to five to ten foot somewhere around there um and then it moves on to the black caiman and the black caiman can get between like i said 16 to the very largest like 18 foot mm-hmm. so um that's sort of the range right now um but yeah that's kind of the basic form but if you think about a lot of animals that got successful like the dinosaurs or um I'll try to use something different, like certain types of fish, like okay. certain types of fish. All it really takes for like, uh, you have an ecosystem. In an ecosystem, you have to like, there are these, niches, these jobs that can be filled in an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. As time goes on or after, or after a massive extinction, that's when you see the highest level of diversity. Per, the end of Permian extinction, going back to the Permian period, they faced a really harsh extinction, which is why Usually, I think it was uh, during the Triassic and onward, you then see this explosion of dinosaurs and flying reptiles and all these animals that filled the niches that were not or weren't available, but opened up, opening this new door for animals to fill. When dinosaurs went extinct, um, animals succeeded because they survived the massive, uh, obviously, uh, Perusosaurus succeeded for a certain amount of time, certain reptiles like Titanobo as well, but... Really, it was the age of mammals for a reason. So and they call this yeah, like was it adaptive cool. radiation? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Okay. That uh, I guess that, that makes sense. Do you? Okay. Do you think? And if you think you. Sorry. Go. Go. What you're about to say. Okay. Um, no, I was just gonna say like um, you can see stuff like that on islands. So think of like Australia, Australia, Madagascar, New Zealand you notice certain levels of diversity that you wouldn't find on normally mainland areas. Mm-hmm. So if you think of New Zealand, for anyone who doesn't really know the prehistory of New Zealand before humans got there, these were the dominant animal. Like there were very few mammals. There's pretty much just bats and some other small mammals. Birds dominated New Zealand for several thousand years. You had the Haas Eagle, which was pretty much the top predator of the environment. Mm-hmm. You have the MOAs. There's like nine species of MOA, by the way. It's not just one. There's nine different species of MOA. And you have all these other birds like kiwis and cockapos and all these different birds that fill those niches that normally mammals would fill. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, mammals didn't really get there, but birds did because they could fly. And then you have this whole history that New Zealand made of just birds being the dominant animal there. There's other examples in, in for other islands, but that's a really prime example. Yeah, then and then people came and just went whoosh. <laughs> we're kind of ruined it for all of them. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay. Speaking okay, so like I know like other islands. So that includes like the Galapagos too, right? Because I remember like, you know, Darwin's study on oh, finches yeah. and you know like island gigantism, like you know the giant Galapagos tortoises, or like you know just weird adaptations that happen just because you mm-hmm. are not connected to a big landmass. Yeah, exactly. Okay, no, that's. It's funny that you say that too. I'm sorry, um, I was gonna say it's funny that you say that too because from what we've found in some situations, mammals, mammals sometimes get smaller and reptiles end up getting larger, and that's something that's kind of been a trend. Um, I think the reasoning for that is because when you're a mammal, you're a warm blooded animal that needs food to succeed versus reptiles that have a slower metabolism. Mm -hmm. If you you make an island, just make an island off the coast of Costa Rica, like Jurassic Park, (laughs) you make this island, (laughs) you make this island and you put, um, certain animals on it. 
-hmm. eventually you're going to find that certain animals are really going to succeed and do well and others may get smaller or just not do well to begin with Mm -hmm. um again Mm -hmm. that's why and i'm trying to think of another example but sometimes usually reptiles get very large because they have slower metabolisms and they're and they finally get resources in food and whatnot they usually get bigger like the galapagos tortoises as well they didn't have a lot of competition. So the Galapagos tortoises evolved into these very large tortoises that mm-hmm. ended up being dominant or on the island. Um, now there's obviously anom- there's different anomalies that can happen. Some mammals end up succeeding and being on top, um, like Madagascar, for example. Um, the fossa, which is a, a weasel or a mongoose type of animal, convergently evolved mm-hmm. to be like a, a small mountain lion. It's very successful. It eats lemurs on the island. It's a very successful predator. It's the largest mammalian predator on Madagascar. Mm-hmm. To put that in perspective too. But again, again, there's it's hard to say that everything's so concrete. It's not concrete. So there's all these different factors that come into place. But again, obviously for anyone who doesn't know this information, I'm trying to kind of um, bring it down to a level where things can be more easily understood. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, okay, yeah. Mm. It's just so crazy thinking how life constantly changes, especially like depending on like the environment or like, you know, the randomness of evolution, you know, like, and, you know, some things are just simply because, you know, for example, like a continent split apart a few thousand years, a few, several ten thousands of years ago, but the animals themselves hadn't changed that much or they changed radically. Um, and I think one example, and I, I noticed this is, for example, with blue tongue skinks, right? Where you have you have the Australian, which even on the continent of Australia, the blue tongue skinks like their patterning and their like their size and like you know, their, their morphology is you know it can differ quite a bit, not as much as like say like varanids, but it differs quite a bit on that continent, and even more so when you go to like Indonesia or like the Key Islands or um, Papua New Guinea, and they have these insane like color patterns, insane different requirements. Because, you know, they've adapted that yeah. way. And I don't know. It's just interesting to think mm-hmm. about. Uh, why, why do you think that reptiles get bigger more so than mammals when they're put on an island? Um, so there, there, there could be a few reasons why. Again, like I said, they have slower metabolism. So when you, um, they can last longer on islands. If you're a mammal, you're warm blooded. You have to fuel your body to keep it going. Mm-hmm. So if you're on a, if you're a tiger, mm-hmm. use some type of predatory mammal. If you're a tiger and you get stuck on this island now, you need enough fuel to fuel that tiger's body. If you have nothing but, uh, let's say, rabbits to eat, this tiger will do could do okay at eating rabbits here and there, but eventually it's, it needs a lot of rabbit to, to fuel its large tiger body, which is why usually you'll see the mammals start to shrink down. Mm-hmm. Reptiles, they have a slower metabolism. So if you put them on an island, if you get, um, a monitor lizard or some type of snake and you put it on an island where it eats rabbits you are really going to make it successful because they're naturally out of size or most snakes and monitor lizards are out of size where they're pretty successful eating rabbit sized animals if you then let's say time goes on this animal is used to eating rabbits and now this other prey or now i'm trying to think how to formulate this so now let's say in order to combat this, this monitor lizards that are eating the rabbits, the rabbits start to get bigger mm-hmm. or, or start to get mm-hmm. larger. So they're harder to do better size ratio to try to get away or um, defend themselves. Okay. At the arms race. Now this monitor lizard is going to get bigger in order to eat this large item. And again, I, I probably didn't phrase the best way I could, but it, you again it's all these factors that come place now you have an arms race now you have all these things that are cut together to make um new ecosystem and that's only we're now we're only talking about the monitor lizard and the rabbit that's not to mention all the other animals that could be living on this island as well Mm -hmm. so again Mm -hmm. that's that's just a very cut type of way to explain it um there's other factors in place i'm going to keep saying that there's other factors in place but um that's sort of a simplified way to try to explain it Mm-hmm. Got you, got you. Dang. Okay. 
so okay, okay let's, yeah. do you think it would, like how long do you think these adaptations would take to evolve obviously it would be like millions of years before like let's say I, like whoops i put some skinks on an island i hope they don't get too big and then you know they become like 50 feet long i think i think you're trying to get the formula for uh komodo dragon size skinks so well, we can work on that. <laughs> uh, that's our that's our secret project on the on the DL. We're gonna make some some Komodo dragon size skinks. Um, can you imagine <laughs> Komodo dragon size skinks? That would be so gnarly. I mean, they just be dogs, oh. right? I mean, I already I feed mine dog food. What's the difference? If it gets yeah, but a I'm picturing bigger. I'm picturing a, a Komodo dragon size blue tongue skink with those stubby legs still. <laughs> uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, the stubby, the stubby thing chasing after you. That would be great. It'd be super cute. Yeah. <laughs> it would be um, so cute. Well, sorry. What was your question again? Like, how do we? How do? How would we like do X thing? I think. I think I was asking how. Like, how would we turn this? You know, these animals. Like, let's say. Let's say. Like, we ha we had the lifespan yeah. of a million years. What would be the perfect environment to turn a blue tongue skink? Like let's let's say we have a population of a hundred blue tongue skinks. We drop them on an island. How do we get them to become giant? I like this. I like this scenario. Again, I'm not. Again, I don't. I'm not. <laughs> He's not about playing God, but this is for, just an example. Oh, I'm saying I can't speak for the whole scientific community because we may get some we may get some comments on this one. But okay, we're gonna we're gonna make a hypothetical. We're gonna try to make big blue tongue skinks. So basically, what we need is we need to have this. I can't believe we're doing this. This is so great. <laughs> we're gonna have this island. Off the coast of Costa Rica. <laughs> We're then gonna put these blue tongue skinks. Volcano, on. no volcano. <laughs> in, order to, in order to make these blue tongue skinks bigger, again, it kind of goes back to the whole big croc thing. We would need the right environment, so it would need to be warm and humid, or at least at least warm enough to fuel their ectothermic bodies. So they're gonna be if they if the temperatures are high, they have an ectothermic body. That means that their rate of metabolism is gonna work faster. So they're gonna be able to um, succeed more, breed more, create more, and that's gonna help them just grow. Um, mm -hmm. Next is gonna be food. Whatever blue tongue skinks eat, we're gonna we would have to make those prey items larger, or we would have to get these prey these blue tongue skinks to eat a new resource that's gonna give them more calories and more more ways to develop that are gonna promote getting larger. Okay. Um, and then it'd be competition. So if we're trying to really just make these blue tongue skinks really big, I mean, there's no way we can't go without competition because if they don't, if they're not competing with other species, they're going to be competing with each other. It's going to be a Komodo dragon type of situation. So got it, got it. Uh, we can't really, we can't really control that. But basically, if we make, if we're trying to make this very simple blueprint want these blue tongue skinks to get larger on this island we need enough food and resources to give them the calories they need to grow and we need to give them the right environment to build their metabolisms to grow grow larger and reproduce more so that's kind of would be the plan okay, <laughs> Let me, okay. now we just need the funding now yeah now we just need the funding to do it all right don't worry <laughs> uh, let me hit up my boy bill gates uh <laughs> Yeah, we'll get on that. You know, hey, honestly, I think we could hit up Elon Musk. Elon Musk would be Elon, down. Elon Musk, yeah, he'd be down. Like, hey, Elon, um, you know, my, my friend Elon, you know, big fan of dinosaur comics. Um, yeah. <laughs> could you give us the so, funding hey, to make our, hey, you know, crazy hey. giant lizard plan a success? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Elon. Like, like, Elon, level with me here. Level like, <laughs> trying to explain this to him. Oh, man. Uh, that's That would be a very, very basic to try to do that could oh, yeah. completely fail um but yeah that's the basic blueprint interesting okay so dang uh, and that's that's the flip side to living on islands too is that because you're not on a main like the main thing of um we'll use um madagascar and africa africa is a huge continent there is uh -huh. a lot of space so if a tsunami were to hit africa Unfortunately, a lot of animals are going to perish, but you still have the rest of Africa for these for other animals to survive. If a tsunami hits Madagascar and it washes yeah. over the entire yeah. island, it mess a lot of things up. Yeah, the the entire lemur population is gone. 
which is it's it's sad to think about because on islands you get diversity you get all these different niches filled by different species on the flip side if something bad were to happen to the island mm -hmm. it's only those species like madagascar madagascar is the only place with lemurs if for whatever reason a tsunami washes over madagascar the entire lemur population is either extinct or severely jeopardized after that mm -hmm. That's that's sort of the trade-off that you get with islands and uh, evolution. And that's that's extremely terrifying to think about, especially because it feels like a lot of you know people don't really care about the environment as much as they should. I mean, obviously, of course, we do have a lot of people who care about you know like saving you know saving environments, saving you know different you know different you know climates from you know you know changing or like you know they care about that. But I feel like we're do you think we're doing enough? right now in order to prevent like certain species from failing i think i think if we i don't i don't want to say the word enough because when you when you put in people's when you put in people's minds we've done enough like we're done we've done enough mm -hmm. then that's when people either get complacent or they abuse that so let's say um i think of an example so basically if we if we said we're done we have enough tigers enough tigers now it's like yay we've done it we we have enough tigers in the wild to succeed think about the influx of poachers and people who want to hunt tigers that would then go out because we're fine we've now completed our goal so really i don't i don't think we're gonna be done i don't think we're ever gonna be done because if you also think too humans are expanding and growing over time so we're in this i don't really want to say conflict because i don't i don't want to use like very harsh sort of words but uh, uh, we do have a difficulty because humans are growing we're expanding but we also have to conserve wild areas for these species mm -hmm. do i think that do i think that humans should get hit by an asteroid no i love people i love <laughs> i really like i'm not joking like i really do love i love people but um and there's some things that we're doing right some things that we're not doing so right but I do think that humans and animals can coexist. We just have to figure it out and implement it. Mm -hmm. And that takes resources, that takes money. And if some people want to invest more of their money in oil than saving tigers or this small tree frog in the, in the center of the South America, it's hard. I know I, 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 I kind of want to laugh as I say it, but really like it's, it's the truth. Like it's a real fact of conservation. Um, a lot of people who do want to save animals, like I said, they want to save the big charismatic stuff. Yeah. A lot of people are focusing on saving, like I said, that small tree frog in South America. But if you speak to people who know a bit about conservation, amphibians and invertebrates, the ones that don't usually get conservation, those are usually the keystone species that let us know something's changing in the environment. Mm -hmm. if, the water, if the water quality is changing in a negative way, amphibians that live in the water are gonna tell us something's wrong before the rhino or the tiger tells us mm -hmm. it really is a trickling like scale if we don't save the tree frog we're gonna have a hard time saving the tiger and also if you think about it too let's say we have enough tigers we've saved the tigers but the environment works in niches and scales mm -hmm. so let's say we have enough tigers we have the ecosystem for it but because we don't have those invertebrates and those tree frogs to help build the food web up to the tiger, the tiger isn't going to do very well for very long. Mm -hmm. So it really is this, again, I'm going to go back to humor, but it really is this circle of life type of deal. Like, And that's hard because we have to let people know that. we Conservation groups are absolutely amazing. And I, I, so for me, I really like when, um, when conservation groups save stretches of land because if you save a stretch of land in the rainforest from getting deforested not only does that save the, the jaguar or x charismatic megafauna you now save every micro organism in that space as well mm -hmm. so yeah if you save a, a certain square of the amazon you're going to help multiple species do i think helping individual species is good yeah of course we did i did a whole event about komodo dragons alone but if you, if you help Komodo dragons, that's helping a species. If you help a square of an, of an environment, you're helping many species out. So exactly. 
both have, both have their place. They're both equally important. Got it. Got it. Got it. No, no, that, that's that's good. That's good. So, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we're, you know, as several scientists, I think it was Carl Sagan who said it, like, you know, we're all connected, you know, I think he also said we're all stardust, and that's like, a very interesting thing to think about. You know, at an atomic yeah. level, we're all made of the same, you know, from the Big Bang, the same stuff um, right. from the stars. And it's it's kind of like scary to think that, you know, we're okay with letting certain things just kind of fall on the wayside. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, a Skink of Death has a question. Um, what is your thoughts on the conservation of pandas? Oh, I think, I think conservation of pandas, like, I think it's good. I think I think having pandas on the planet is a good thing. We don't like. I'm not. I'm not gonna be here on this podcast and say ah they can go. Like they're done. Like no, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> like I don't. I, I'm not gonna say that, and I don't believe that. I think pandas are valuable to the ecosystem, and they have their place. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been to zoos with pandas before. I've been. I've. Uh, I, I like to visit zoos just to kind of see how things run and things like that. I've been to the Calgary Zoo in Alberta, Canada. Uh-huh. They used to have pandas. They don't have them anymore. Uh, but when I went, they had pandas. These pandas lived in the best enclosure I, I have ever seen. I'll describe it to you. Mm-hmm. They had an indoor and an outdoor setting. You could shut the door, like the keepers, like if they it was getting towards nighttime or getting too hot or cold for them, they could have them just inside or outside. Uh-huh. They had an indoor and outdoor section. The outdoor had... The outdoor had wild bamboo and different features for them to climb on, different uh, like tree trunks and rocks for them to interact with. The inside of the enclosure was temperature controlled, humidity controlled, gave them plenty of food and resources, and had air conditioning if it got too hot. They had everything an animal could ever ask for. Mm-hmm. was it was the best animal enclosure i have ever seen so far it was crazy it was so cool that's that's no that's like yeah no they're treated like royalty is there why did they why did they um why are the pandas not there anymore so what happened oh COVID really is the short answer but basically what happened was uh that uh, as far as i remember calgary zoo had two pandas i'm not a spokesperson for the calgary zoo but here's what i know so the calgary zoo this is public knowledge um, the Calgary Zoo had two pandas, from what I remember, mm. um, in their temperature-controlled environment, and um, they had to get bamboo shipped from China to Canada. Okay. Covid nineteen okay. put a very big damper on that, so they weren't able to ship bamboo as frequent and the quantity. I believe the same quantity. So basically, the pandas couldn't get enough food. So before they re- uh, they had enough food, but they were starting to realize like, hey, this isn't working out so well. So they made the decision to actually send the pandas back to China. But like they got sent to probably a sanctuary or zoo that could be able to take them and give them um, food and resources that they need. That's okay. So, and not like, not just like the outdoor, indoor humidity temperature controlled. They also had like this, um, chinese inspired like walkway with like building like building structures and all this stuff they had videos playing on screens about panda facts and all this stuff like it was it was so cool like if i could see something like that but it was for like a komodo dragon or some type of like reptile or your head would explode (laughs) yeah and it's, I say that too because the Komodo dragons were right next. They had Komodo dragons. They had Komodo dragons right next to the pandas. So uh, you look at the right. Well, the the Komodo dragons were kept really well, mm-hmm. but you have them in a really. They had a really nice enclosure. Um, but you could definitely tell looking at the right. Okay, very nice enclosure. Like they fit all the stamps of welfare. Pandas had their whole gateway and buildings and temperature and humidity control. Like, you you could just tell. Like, the pandas they, got the love. They had the luxury um, apartment, bro. So that's what they had. Yeah, luxury. Yeah, honestly, and that's the thing. That's yeah, really. But any any zoo that has pandas makes it known they have pandas mm-hmm. for good reason because pandas pandas are basically like they are like the a conservation. Animal, yeah, mascot. like they're the yeah they're the mascot of conservation. Um, and I think I think keeping pandas is good. Like keep pandas. Like we want them in the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just just to put in perspective, like the level of care 
people put into pandas, let alone all these other species, but pandas get the luxury apartment. They're getting some love. <laughs> they live in better than me. No, I'm just... <laughs> Dang. Nah, what is the, like, wor- I don't say worst. You don't have to name drop the zoo, but what is, like, the worst condition you've seen, like, an animal in, in, like, a zoo environment? Honestly, I haven't seen one. I'm being I'm being really honest. Like I'm not trying to like rush over it. The zoos that I've been to are AZA accredited zoos. Okay. So AZA means that it's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Okay. If you are an AZA zoo, that basically means you fit the highest level of standards for a zoo. That means uh, nutrition, animal welfare, space. You you fit it all. So if you if any person watching this, if you live in uh miami or you live in florida miami zoo aza accredited it's a freaking nice zoo i haven't been there i know i know someone from there but it's a really nice zoo san diego zoo aza accredited all these other zoos that they have an aza accreditation they fit a certain level of standards and it's not it's not just an aza person comes picks off their clipboard and then you're good to go you're aza accredited they come around every few years to reassess whether you're fitting those standards or not and if you don't fit them, you don't get that check mark and you're not an AZA accredited zoo anymore. Mm-hmm. So in simple terms, you lose your clout. <laughs> you lose your clout. You, you lose your clout. Like you lose your, well, really, you lose your accreditation, you lose your prestige, you lose, you lose basically saying you fit these high standards. Uh-huh. So like I said, AZA will go to a zoo that's AZA accredited or someone who wants to register to be AZA accredited. They, have all of their criteria they're looking for and I'm, I'm making it look like a like just one clipboard this is paperwork this is um records this is forms this is all sorts of stuff Physi- physically seeing the enclosures and the animals like it's a whole it's like it's a whole long effort to prove that you deserve to be aza accredited mm-hmm. so for a lot of people um, who may be skeptical about zoos and say oh like zoos like they just live in they just live in these enclosures and they they isn't it so sad all well, animals in an aza accredited zoo they grow they fit the highest standards possible mm-hmm. i think a lot of things too is that i think and i love animal documentaries i think great but i think a lot of people take their understanding of animals from documentaries where they're always seeing the lion chase the wildebeest, where they're yeah. always seeing animals do dynamic, um, dynamic things, and that's a we can relate that to the paleo world, or paleo art as well, old paleo art. Mm-hmm. Um, but animals rest, animals sleep, animals take like they're not always constantly fighting and hunting. What do you they mean? Can play. I mean, crocodiles don't aren't yeah. killing things twenty four seven. Like you don't gotta drop like a baby in every crocodile enclosure every ten minutes to like have someone kill yeah, someone. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, animals, animals aren't, also, if you think about it too, conserving energy, animals, it, you're an animal. You don't like, obviously in there's, they're in the zoo environment. They may start to remember the schedule when they get fed, but for an animal, you want to conserve your energy. You want to conserve resources. Mm-hmm. Obviously they're going to, mm-hmm. they're going to run around there. They get to run around, play and have the space to do so at AZA credit zoos. But when you think about a fundamental level of a living being, you want to conserve your energy because that's wasting calories and wasting energy and resource in of yourself, your metabolism. So again, with the nature documentaries, you always see lions running around and eating wildebeest and zebras, but lions spend 14 to 18 hours per day just resting. Mm-hmm. That's, an enti- that's mostly an entire day, 14 to 18 hours just resting. That's they may get, they'll get up, they'll stretch their legs, they'll move around, they'll play with one another. But that's a lot of resting. And so when you go to a zoo and you hear someone say, why isn't the lion doing anything? Why isn't it hunting and running around and doing all that? It can it can still play and do those things, but it's not doing that 100% of the day because it's going to conserve resources and rest. Mm-hmm. That's, what a lot of, that's what a lot of species, not just lions and crocodilians and all that, but that's just, you know, yeah, things to consider. We can relate that to paleo because now let's think of paleo art. We obviously can't see non-avian dinosaur is an extinct species so we can't really see their behavior but if we take modern birds again birds rest mm-hmm. birds run around sometimes 
predatory birds, they hunt, they forage for food, they have different dynamic behaviors that they do in their environment. So for dinosaurs, if you think of, you know, if you're drawing a T-Rex, if you think of a T-Rex, yeah, it's a predator, but it's not, it's not like the old paleo are constantly, you know, constantly killing things. Yeah, it's exactly. not, yeah, it's not, it's not always ripping Triceratops' head off and all of that. It's not, that's not, it's life. <laughs> but yeah, it's animals live. T-Rex, T-Rex has to sleep at some point. It has to take a nap. Sometimes T-Rex, like, I'm not trying to personify, but you know, they have different dynamic behaviors and that's with any animal, modern and extinct. So I really like what new, what paleo artists are doing now. And even you showing it, I've seen it in your work too. You're showing natural behaviors. So I, I feel like in this yeah, new wave it. of paleo art, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I feel in this new wave of paleo art right now, the one thing I look at when I look at paleo art is natural behaviors. I mean, don't get me wrong, like they're gonna hunt. You're gonna see people love watching like hunting yeah. art and like dynamic. Yeah, this is, like in my comics, that's like when the when that happened, that's what I called the money shot. <laughs> you know, like yeah, people yeah. love this violence. <laughs> but you know, yeah. I know I get what you yeah, mean. Man, like, yeah. Just... You need to show like natural behaviors in order to like, you know, these are animals, they're dynamic, they have lives. You know, they don't it's it's like yeah. us, like people, you know, like or like, you know, a boxer. A boxer is not just walking up to people in the street and just yeah. start punching people, you know, he has a life too, he has to rest. Yeah. You know, it's prepared for fight, you know, it's not like Muhammad Ali was just walking up to people just punching them like that, you know what I mean? I have that picture in my mind. <laughs> like, What's up, oh, sucker? Like, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Your Dilophosaurus, your Dilophosaurus always got some money shots if we're talking about that. <laughs> that thing is, that thing is going to town on some stuff. I know, that, that one was very fun to do, but yeah, I feel, a part of me like kind of regrets making it I feel like I made it a little too violent, you know, but at the same time, it was, I, I guess it was a lot of fun. Um, people got to see like glimpses of like the actual animal behind the comic. So yeah. I guess I did my job. I can't be mad. Oh, I like it. I, I really liked what you did because again, like, yeah, the hunting, hunting predation and the goriness, the nature is metal side of things. That's real. That's another real thing about dinosaurs and prehistoric life and actual animals. Like that's a, Nature's metal part is real. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just when when people make that the only thing, and I, you already know that, you know, like when people make it the only thing about animals, the only behavior that they have is fighting each other, ripping each other apart, blood and guts and all that stuff. Like, I want to see a picture of, I want to see an image of, you know, someone take like a, a Triceratops taking a nap. Or, like, <laughs> it's uh, it's random, but it's wow. it's true. Like, why is he always gotta be fighting sleep? for his life? Why can't he just chill, man? I feel you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, yeah, and Jim, it, Jimmy, like, Jimmy said in the chat, like, no, everyone, like, everyone says, where is T-Rex? But nobody asks, how is T-Rex? <laughs> it's true. I agree. I agree. Oh, man. You got to get Jimmy on this thing. Jimmy would be great. Um, some, um, yeah, point, you're Jimmy right. Yeah. Um, no, one, no one's asking how t how T-Rex is. So, <laughs> um, again, it's just, I think for me too, it's part of what I really like is that I try to bridge together modern animals and extinct animals and try to make this fit together, you know? Mm -hmm. So again, like I said, like a picture of Triceratops fighting against a T-Rex with his blood and guts, like, yeah, that's a, I, that is a reality that, that could have definitely happened and very well did happen. But also Triceratops like taking a nap or like, uh, laying eggs, or or if it laid eggs, I don't want to make an assumption, but yeah, it's just it laid eggs. I, I'm pretty sure we have some ceratops and egg remains. <laughs> yeah, um, even just like uh, well, a big thing, a big pattern has been display structure. Display structure has been all over paleo art, which I I like it. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. Um, but yeah, I I like display. I like people doing. I mean, there's I mean, I don't I don't think T Rex was was green and purple like barney but i think it, it, there's a bit so it could have had some display colors and different things like that you know to establish itself as an animal or a sexual display i mean sexual display has been a whole thing for which uh, spinosaurus for the sale mm -hmm. um people are still debating on what all that's for so again i think if i'm not an artist so i'm not going to critique art but i do think um, for any person who wants to draw something or depict um, depict a uh, extinct animal, look at 
look at other animals that are alive today. What can you pick up? What behaviors seem relevant? So for, let's say someone's trying to depict a behavior for a dinosaur, um, the two closest relatives we have to dinosaurs are the avian birds and the crocodilians. Mm -hmm. um, cro crocodilians are semi-aquatic, so that's a little, that may be a little harder, but the bird behavior, what do birds do? What are some little things that they, you know, when they bob their head when they walk or little things like that, how do they rest? Like if you see, if you've ever seen an ostrich or cassowary sit down, they sit like they have their their front feet in front of them, and they kind of just sit on their on their butt. So they're like two feet are hanging out, and they're sitting down like that. Um, did dinosaurs sit like that? I don't know. I can't say. I wasn't I wasn't there 66 million years ago. But that's something to consider. Did you know? Did they for how they foraged for their food? How they slept? Mm -hmm. um, how did they rear their young? Um, some birds like the cassowary. Um, the males rear, rear the chicks, and the female leaves. They, the male and female mate lays her clutch, and then it's up to the male to incubate and raise the young from their birth up until they're old enough to fend them for themselves. Mm -hmm. Is it possible dinosaur, some dinosaurs did that? It's possible. Did it happen? I don't know. But there's a possibility for that. Yeah, there's a, there is a I mean, like, obviously, we have, like, some, you know, remains of family groups found together. Obviously, that's not complete direct evidence that you know these dinosaurs were a family group but yeah. they help us lean close to the answer you know what i mean like maybe they engage a lot in mod mo mobbing behavior maybe there was a lot of you know maybe there was, a, there was a social aspect to like their living where maybe they didn't necessarily live in packs but you know there's still a social aspect to their you know like day-to-day -day lives but you know i guess that's a painful thing about paleontology we'll never know unless we'll, yeah. and we'll should... try to make the best of yeah, we'll try to make the best assessments we can. Like like when Scott was talking about Velociraptor may not have been very fast. Like mm -hmm. he go, he, Scott went to a really good breakdown of the size of this limb bone and this limb bone relative to the size of the leg. Like that's a really good breakdown to tell people Velociraptor may not have been very fast. When of course Jurassic Park and media tells us speed of speed, like it, it's very fast when that gets debunked. Like Scott did a great job on that one, but um. Uh, there's a lot of things that um, that's there, that's a whole rabbit hole on media too because um, I like Jurassic Park. I think Jurassic Park was great. Um, honestly, I kind of I, I go back and forth on Jurassic World, but um, just modern media and how we depict dinosaurs, it's getting more and more important because now we're in this sort of time where paleo art's doing really well on doing natural behaviors the media the stuff that again i i always say the general public people who don't really know this stuff and are barely getting into it general public sees jurassic world they see the indoraptor kids that think the indoraptor is real there's kids yeah. that think indominus rex is a real dinosaur i've got in I've, DMs. Seen it I've got in the dms man can you do a comic on uh, dominus rex is my favorite dinosaur I'm like i'm sorry buddy that would be a good april schools though uh, reality is I mean, <laughs> yeah no i i get it you know, but I, yeah, that's why I, I, I started my comic series mainly because I wanted to, you know, debunk a lot of like, you know, popular ideas about dinosaurs that, you know, pop culture gets wrong. But, yeah. You know, yeah, if you don't, if you don't like what's getting made, you know, like make something yourself, right? That like, if, like echoes what you would like to see in like, you know, the uh, exactly. and stuff. Yeah. And it's the same thing that I said about like the reptile hobby and getting into that, like, doing your research you can find a book that depicts like you can find a very recent book that talks about dinosaurs in a more modern animal light like natural behaviors and things like that like the art that you see on twitter or instagram like you you'll start to notice more modern natural stuff if you continue to look at um like old stuff like paleo like paleo art from the 80s i mean don't get me wrong like paleo art in the 80s and the 90s like that was good at the time it was at least showing animal like iguanodon wasn't slow lumbering around dragging its tail uh -huh. they show them as dynamic animals i think actually i'll use I, I would use those examples as we're moving into a better direction exactly I'll use it as a good i'll use it as a good example we're moving in a better direction um and now yeah we're putting uh we're putting uh we're thinking about considering feathers um, did every dinosaur have feathers? I don't know. There's people who are smarter than me that figured it out. But at least like we have some animals like um, Tyrannus, Cetacosaurus, mm -hmm. Cynoceropterus, animals that gave us those examples. Um, 
there be larger dinosaurs? I mean, well, your Tyrannus is larger, but are there larger dinosaurs that could have had others? Yeah, it could have been sparse. It could have been quill knobs or whatever it might have been. Um, but yeah, I think just kind of assess too, because when you have, um, let's say, your Tyrannus is large, a larger dinosaur. But I think if you think about a, saur a sauropod, I don't personally think was covered in a full coat of feathers like a crow or any other bird. Like Me that's too. just, yeah. Um, but I think the uh, feathers got really big a couple years back in paleo art. And now I think we're, we're starting to consider, okay, if this animal was this large, it lived in this type of environment. Maybe feathers would have been kind of there, but sparse. Like it didn't cover the whole body. So yeah, I really think there's some people who are really like doing great stuff. Like I'm not just trying to stroke your ego. I think you're doing great stuff. Um, but also like, <laughs> Thanks, uh, Julio Lucerta. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Julio Lucerta, like, uh, again, he's my, like we're friends, but I would, I would truly say like, he's doing a great job. Like he's considering these types of aspects. Um, another one, uh, Serpinillus, uh, Gabriel Yugetto, like he, he makes art pieces like they're masterpieces i know he just like, like pulls it out like yeah this is for my personal library i just do this sketch for like an hour it's like oh my god this is I, a whole I, piece, I've, man. I've spoken to him i've spoken to him before he's he's a, so awesome he's great um yeah it's it's so funny because you'll see him like oh it'll be like early in the morning like yeah i'm just working on this quick sketch for like an hour and then it's like a masterpiece so good exactly like um, you're a liar you know you're a liar gabriel stop stop lying you spend like 10 hours on this it would take me 10 hours <laughs> at least that's my opinion you know <laughs> those are those are just some people off the top of my head that i think are like just doing so like great like i want i want what what um you julio and gabe again i'm not trying to stroke your ego buddy but <laughs> i want like stuff like you and julio and gabriel like those examples are depicting dinosaurs Imagine a Jurassic World like that. Imagine Acrocanthosaurus or T Rex or um, Brachiosaurus, like depicted in these types of ways, like actual animals. Like, um, obviously, our friend Charles, like, Charles is making this whole project about what if Jurassic World had competent keepers? Like, exactly. That's huge. <laughs> that's huge. And I, I really hope that project just freaking slams because, mm -hmm. yeah. The stuff that ha like the stuff that happens in Jurassic World, how how would that happen if the keepers actually knew what they were doing? Like, exactly. I mean, have you seen Camp Cretaceous, right? A little bit. It was it's it's like this is the world's most incompetent theme park slash zoo. How how are like how is this zoo still like running? You know, like these kids were able to mess up so much stuff in like. I don't even know how long they were on like the island. They were like on the island for like a day. They're already like sneaking in and destroying things, almost getting killed. And it's like, how is this zoo like? You know, how did pass inspection, man? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's a great that's a great leeway because we just talked about like the AZA and accreditation. If you have a freaking dinosaur zoo, you're like you're damn right. You're you should get accredited for that. Like you should be able to fit these certain levels of standards to these animals give them space give them animal welfare because I, I i think it was in jurassic one of the jurassic worlds like oh do dinosaurs have rights yes they're freaking living beings like they have rights they need to have enough space and enough food and enough everything so if our, if our buddy charles wants to hit us hit me up and talk about some zoo stuff like <laughs> i'm down for that um, <laughs> i mean he did work at the monterey bay aquarium <laughs> oh yeah you're right you're right but still i mean um yeah but yeah if there was a jurassic world a jurassic park that had these competent keepers like when an animal gets out of a zoo there's protocols for that i mean obviously i guess in jurassic world they did that like shoot the indominus rags yeah like um, bye die boom and they killed it and then i don't know this for me like i don't know jurassic world had a lot of a lot of issues that I, <laughs> like that was like one of them oh, yeah. i don't know exactly but again it goes back to okay we have we have this dinosaur park we're gonna put we have we've made x amount of dinosaurs and it's these species okay how do we fit the enclosures and make sure they don't get out and we give them the proper nutrition and we have the right staff and keepers for this stuff what happens when an animal gets out do we have protocols for that like those are all things that a regular zoo would have why not how would a dinosaur zoo not have those things 
I feel like you would especially have those types of things in a dinosaur zoo because exactly. they're freaking dinosaurs. <laughs> exactly, dude. It's like, oh my goodness. What were they thinking? <laughs> exactly. uh, I, yeah. They're yeah. no expense, though. <laughs> I don't know. After watching Camp Cretaceous, it really feels like they spared a lot of expense. I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah. But um, exactly. I'm actually almost done with this T-Rex. I just got to add some highlights to make it pop a bit more. Sick. Yeah. But yeah, dang. Do you think there there could be a successful Jurassic Park? Like in like okay in, in our gotta, reality I, I need context here so <laughs> you're saying as in like we we have the we have the technology we have dinosaurs made yes we have the genomes and all that we've made dinosaurs now we have to build a zoo for these dinosaurs like will that actually be successful mm -hmm. i mean definitely i think i it depends on the species because if like think about i'm already thinking of like sauropods for example sauropods sauropods would be the zoo itself that's if true. you really think about it, like truly, like el like elephants and other large megafauna, rhinos, elephants, all that, the amount of food they need to eat is a lot. So if you take a sauropod, which is 10 tons or more, and you need to feed that thing, it's going to be the zoo, the whole zoo's budget. Like really, like I'm not joking. Like It's the actual zoo's budget just to feed a sauropod on a consistent basis. I'm only talking about, I'm really what I'm saying is I'm talking about one sauropod. I'm not talking about a, a herd of them. Dang, that's true. It's crazy. <laughs> also, so the smell would be, be something. There'd be a, there'd be a, there'd yeah, be a hell of a smell. I, that would have came to my mind later. That would have came to my mind later, but yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. I, 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 like, uh, I, I went, because uh, I, I went hiking this morning and yeah, it, uh, there was some cows we passed by. It was it was real stinky, but um, yeah. um Evan has a question in the chat. Um, okay. What are your thoughts on Prehistoric Kingdom? So that's funny because I actually don't play video games very much. I actually, don't play the last video game I played. Um, I played Magic: The Gathering Arena. I like Magic: The Gathering. Uh -huh. um, that was the last game I ever played online. So I have not played a game since. Um, it's funny when people say like, oh, oh, I love playing the Isle. I love playing Prehistoric Kingdom. I love playing this and that. And I'm just like, <laughs> I'm working two jobs and have to do the social media stuff. I don't like, yeah, I feel like time. if I play, I feel like if I play video games, I would not get anything. I would not get anything. Done. That's true. So I, I actually am really curious to play Prehistoric Kingdom. I'll think about it, but I also feel if I get sucked in this rabbit hole, we're gonna see less frequent posts from me on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind. That's the trade-off. <laughs> you could you could use it as, as content. You say, "Hey, it's Crikey, it's Christian. Let's play oh. Bro Fist, PewDiePie, <laughs> PewDiePie." You can, me, uh, you can find me streaming on Twitch at Crikey, it's Christian playing priest. Actually, uh, write that down. <laughs> there, you go, there you go. I I feel like it's a good educational opportunity, especially because Prehistoric Kingdom I think has the biggest like education opportunity of all the dinosaur games that are going to come out soon like path of titans is fun but it doesn't it, it, it's it's a survival mmo like where you play as a dinosaur and you kill yeah. each other right it's not exactly you know mm -hmm. like yeah yay you know you know here's the education part no i mean like yes the dinosaurs are made are modeled quite accurately but it, the whole point of the game doesn't involve um education well prehistoric kingdom is about making a zoo which in itself is a resource of education and i don't know i'm pretty excited i i, I didn't pre-order it i i I feel sad because I'll have to wait till I don't know what's the, what's the third quarter of the year. It's like after like August or uh, something. I think so. Yeah. Septemberish. Septemberish. Yeah, I'm gonna have to uh, wait till then because I didn't pre-order. Yeah, I'll can. Uh, yeah, I, that's that's a good point. I think I'll I'll try to look into it at pre-store. You know, I think I think that'd be cool. Sure. Um. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, no, I was just saying um, the whole dinosaur zoo thing. Like, I think it's, I think it could be possible. It just depends on the dinosaurs. Like, if you like Cynoceropteryx and Velociraptor, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Giant, uh, twenty-ton sauropod, not easy. T-Rex also probably wouldn't be very easy. So it just depends on. It literally is like a species by species type of thing. So for that's sure. just my two cents on it. For sure, for sure. Yeah. All right, give me a sec. Um. Okay, so. It looks like we're out of time. So here is the Rex I have finished. 
Oh man. I don't know. Let me cool. zoom out a little bit. I don't know. I, I, people can't see the tip of the tail. There we go. Here's a Rex I finished. This was a load of fun to do. My hand is kind of crampy. But, um, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, it's so sick though. Thank you. Thank you. But um, yeah, thank you, Christian. Um, before we go, how can people reach out to you? Oh, good question. So you can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at Crikey's Christian. Um, uh, Twitter has a character limit, so Crikey's Christian is going to be spelled a little bit differently. Um, but yeah, so Crikey's Christian on Instagram and Twitter. Um, ah, thank you, Andy. I appreciate being here. It was a, time flew. Time flew, time flew by. Like, oh, we went over the two hour mark. But yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Reach out to Christian if you have any questions about why, why his wildlife education work, about animals, about conservation. He does a lot of awesome conservation work. Anyway, guys, thank you for joining me and Christian today on Drawing with Dinosaur Comics. We'll be back next week with another special guest. Anyway, thank you, everyone. And here we go. About to, I'm about to end the stream. All right.